welcome everyone um, to this week's edition of the Objector Church Weekly Webcast. This is a chance for our members and friends to reconnect with each other. We also seek to inspire, we seek to inform, and we seek to also have some interaction. The inspiration part is we're trying to delve into things that can lift us up, that can help us in our struggles to make the world a more just, better place, and to be more happy ourselves in the meantime. The information part is tangible, actionable things that we can do. And finally, interaction is we try as much as possible for this not just to be a one-way conversation, um, information distribution, but rather for it to be a real conversation. We welcome comments. The only thing we ask is treat people nice, uh, don't be a jerk. Um, but we welcome comments, disagreement, A-OK, -okay, that's not a problem. We welcome all comments. So. One thing we do before we get started, um, we do, on our webcast, we've always had a little bit of a ritual. We're religious humanist interfaith community, so we try to not use things that are tied to one expression or another, but we do, we have been lighting candles at the beginning as an expression of our hopes for the future and the hopes of what could be. So I'm going to go and light these candles and just take a moment here and welcome you to take a moment, take a deep breath, to center yourselves, and we're going to be dealing with some uh, some inspiring history, some difficult history, some sad things as well. But in this, um, lighting these candles just is an expression of we're present in this moment and through the good times, through the bad, uh, we're there for each other. So anyway, with the candles lit, I wanna go ahead and welcome our guest for tonight, uh, Victor Augusto Bisuela. And um, he was my client 10 years ago in one of my most fun cases, to say the least. And so tonight I wanted Victor to come back. Uh, this is 10 years out uh, from some of the initial actions in his case, um, acts of resistance. So I wanted to have him on to talk about his experiences in the military, his decision to resist, and also just a little bit of what do we do with this kind of history? What, where does it take us? What do we do with it? So I want to welcome Victor to the show and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, James. It's great to be here. Well, for again, anyone's questions, comments, please feel free to post them. But I thought what we might begin tonight is, uh, Victor, I wonder if you could share a little bit about how old were you when you decided to join the military and why you decided to join in the first place? Well, I officially joined when I was 20. I'm not sure when I made the decision to join. Um, I, I wasn't doing that well in college. I didn't, I didn't really want to be sitting in classrooms. I wanted to, to see the world. I wanted to gain skills. Um, I, also, I also had patriotic motivations. I believe that the military was defending the country against you know, terrorism and all that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, so I, I was 20 years old when I got in. Yeah. So when you joined, what did you see the role of the military being? The role of the military, I guess, just, um, just what everyone grows up believing that it's, it defends the country against, you know, any threats and, And that it was, uh, for the most part, a good a force for good in the world. Sure, sure. So could you tell us a little bit about your time in the military, and when did that view change for you? I think that it was pretty good uh, before, before I went to Iraq. Mm -hmm. How long were you in before you went to Iraq, by the way? Let's see, I got in August 2005, left for Iraq. I don't even remember the month anymore, September or October 2006. Mm -hmm. So about a year? About a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happened in Iraq that, cha that changed your perspe pers pers uh, perspective? Well, in Iraq, I, um, you know, I, never left, I never left base, so I never was involved in any kind of uh, combat or anything. Um, but I guess little things just kind of, uh, just kind of triggered other thoughts about, about what was going on. I see uh, contractors making a lot of money, a tax free, and that this was sort of what like a lot of uh, people in my unit wanted to do afterwards is just become a contractor and make all this, you know, six figures uh, tax free. And, and to me, it just seemed very odd that, that there was all this money. Mm -hmm. and, 
and, and I don't know, I guess it's starting from where it's like, well, maybe this is about more than, you know, just bringing democracy to Iraq or, uh, you know, protecting America. There might be some other, other motivations involved there. And I, I don't know, I think uh, at some point I started watching some documentaries, uh, like, some, like a John Pilger documentary, like a, a War on Democracy or whatever, some things about uh, the attempted coup in Venezuela in 2002. I also uh, read a few books. I read The Hegemony or Survival of Chomsky. And so, yeah, by the time I read that book, I was very, <laughs> I was just part of, <laughs> I was just part of a machine that was uh, not doing anything good, that was just out to extract resources and, and you know, extend the power of, of basically the ruling elite of this country. Mm -hmm. and, um, how long was your deployment? Uh, 14 months. Okay. And while you were there, what was your job? What was your MOS? My MOS was 25 Foxtrot Network Switching Systems Operator slash Maintainer. But I didn't actually do that. Mm -hmm. um, I just did like low-level IT stuff. I like formatted people's computers, installed operating systems, messed around with routers a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, nothing, nothing too involved. So after your Iraq deployment, and approximately when was that? Let's see, uh, September, October 06 to November of 07. I don't know. <laughs> I mm -hmm. Okay. So from there, how long were you, were you, you were stationed at Fort Hood, correct? Yes. And, um, how long, um, so you had about, about a year or so before you got to the point of having a crisis of what to do. And, and um, tell me, could you tell us a little bit what life was like? I guess maybe I'm thinking about is with the, the blinders off, but you're still in the army, you're doing your job. What was that experience like for you? Um, well, in Iraq, I guess once I realized what I was a part of, um, I just felt like really guilty. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to be a part of it. Like I, it just started to really weigh on me a, a lot. And um, I think when I was in Iraq, I had already made certain decisions. Like, like if I was ever deployed to uh, South America to, <laughs> to like topple the Venezuelan government, that I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I already knew that I was not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, yeah, just... Uh, as, as soon as I came to the realization, I, I had already had those types of feelings and those thoughts. And, and as soon as I got back, um, one of the first things I looked into was, what do I need to do to, like, in case they try to deploy me again? Mm -hmm. what I need to do? And I started looking into, uh, into going to Canada, because mm -hmm. I that was something that was very common uh, during the Vietnam era. But uh, I had read a few stories and it just, it didn't seem like a path I wanted to take. Sure. Not that it was something that I wrote off completely, but, but it just, from what I'd seen from other resistors who had gone to Canada and they were like in limbo and not, not able to return. Although now, like living in Canada actually sounds really nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, and so and through that process, I, I found out about groups like VFP and Veterans for Peace and Iraq Veterans Against the War, uh, now known as uh, Bot Face, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was uh, through that that I, I became involved in the activist community. I, I became a member of, of IBAW. Mm -hmm. um, they reached out to me and connected me with a soldier that was there at Fort Hood, uh, Ron Cantu. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met him, I met the, uh, the other members of IBAW there locally. Mm -hmm. uh, Cindy Thomas, who would later become a very important figure in, in my life. Mm -hmm. And so then I just sort of just became an activist and I just kind of embraced like progressive activism on the whole mm -hmm. from that point on. And that was, yeah, probably early 2008. Okay. I just, I just, now, how did your command react when you first started becoming engaged in activism? Did they express concern? Were they indifferent? They, um, they didn't know. I mean, I mean, it wasn't something I went around like telling them about or mm -hmm. 
telling other people. And if they did, I mean, they didn't, they didn't say anything to me about it. I mean, I don't know how strong the, uh, the intelligence apparatus is around those things, mm -hmm. but, but I don't, I don't think they really knew. Yeah. Um, what about your, your peers, your coworkers? Do, were they, do they know about it or is it something you kind of, I mean, a lot of my clients over time, they end up almost having two lives, one life on post, one life off post. Was it like that for you or did your coworkers, did they know more about what you did off? You know, how did that work out for you? Well, the thing is for, for me, the, that period of activism and then, you know, May 1st with my counseling statement was, was not that long. Like, it was, it was all in the same year. Like my activism, mm -hmm. activism started maybe February and then everything just blew open like May 1st or, so there wasn't a huge period of time where, you know, that was doing activism and, and it wasn't known. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I will mention just for our audience that the, one of the common misconceptions is, is that members of the military do not have the right to participate in activism, to do protests, to engage in, and there are some restrictions on that um, under how the Supreme Court is currently ruled on the First Amendment. But for the most part, service members are allowed to do quite a bit of activism. The main restrictions come in the electoral political arena. The other thing is that basically you can't do protests and whatnot while in uniform on post in a foreign country. Beyond that, servicemembers have a significant amount of First Amendment rights, contrary to popular opinion. So I do want to explain that a lot of times what service members face isn't formal repercussions, but more informal uh, peer pressure, uh, more, more um, implied pressure, but not actual direct retaliation. So just want to throw that out there. So tell us, Victor, could you tell us a little bit about when you're, you're nearing the end of your contract uh, at this point, and then like approximately when were you supposed to be getting out? Uh, in August of, uh, of, of, 09. of 09. Okay. But before that, something happened that derailed that and really set your course in a different direction. Could you share with us a little bit about that? Right. I was, um, stop lost. I'm not sure how how early on I knew this. I might have been might have been towards the end of 07 or early 08. Mm -hmm. not, but I knew that that I would that I was stop lost or that I would be stop lost. It was it was pretty certain in within my unit that we would be stop lost for a long time. Like we just knew that that was something that was going to happen. I don't, I don't recall exactly how long we knew that was going to be the case, but uh, Basically, what stop loss was was that the army can keep you longer than your uh, than than the active part of your contract uh, in, to deploy you. So, uh, I'm not sure exactly when my unit ended up leaving, but I would have I guess probably would have gotten out July 2010 or something like that. I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. But you got the notification of stop loss and that there was a deployment coming. Um, at, w at w how did your decision making analysis go? I mean, to the, I mean, I, and I don't want you to share anything you don't want to share, but what was that process like for you to work through those things? Hmm. Well, um, I mean, I knew it was something I didn't want to do I, mm -hmm. from the beginning. Um, but you know, just uh, have those concerns of well, am I going to destroy my life if I <laughs> if I mm -hmm. do something like if I if I you know just go AWOL or you know what is that going to mean for me? Am I going to be in prison for a long time? And so that those were certainly uh, considerations. Um, but I, I guess at some point, with all the activism that I was doing, it just felt the, the cognitive dissonance became too strong. Mm -hmm. I could do this and like say I believed in these things and then, you know, still deploy. Like I just didn't, it was just very, very difficult to, to live with, I guess, you know, it's just. Mm -hmm. By the way, I just want to mention for anyone watching, you're watching the live webcast of the Objector Church. We do this every week and this week we're interviewing one of my old clients, war resistor Victor Augusto Brizuela. 
Uh, so if you have questions, comments, please feel free to post them. I'm trying to monitor the, the chat things as best I can. But if we have any comments, we'd love to hear, um, hear them and we'll read them over the air and talk about them. Um, one thing I remember though, Victor, from that time period, I remember us having a conversation about whether we should, whether you should go the conscientious objector route uh, mm -hmm. versus not going some other route. And I recall my end of the conversation, but I, I, I always wonder in memory how accurate your memories are. So what do you remember as far as, and we, we discussed that, or your, why did you not go that route? Well, I guess, um, Part of it is just that, well, in the military, they consider a conscientious objector someone who is opposed to war completely. Basically, you have to be a pacifist. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a position I respect, but it is not my position, wasn't then and, and still not today. It's not mm -hmm. And so for me to like, I, I don't know, to go through that process and pretend that, that, uh, that I just didn't believe in in war at all, or that I wouldn't pick up a gun and, and do what I needed to do, depending on the situation, is just not something I was prepared to do, a, a farce I wasn't really prepared. I didn't really want to do it. I mean, I guess it would have been better than deploying for sure. But um, but I, I don't know, and I, it was, it was, another thing, another thing about it is just the process itself. The, the bureaucracy of it did not appeal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to do all this paperwork. I'm going to have to do all this. And at the end of the day, they may still deny the, the claim, the claim. And it's like, no, I just look, I'm not going to go. I want to get out of the army and that's it. Like that. And so I think that was another, another aspect of it that I never really articulated in those days, but thinking of it now, it's just, yeah, it's just not, not a process I wanted to go through. Yeah. And you're not the first person who's told me that. I had one client actually who did go through the process in the end, but he ended up a good chunk of his application. He wanted to spend denouncing the process. And uh, his argument was, was that it was, um, he didn't think it was fair that the government could judge something as subjective and personal to him as his beliefs. And I, it made, I don't know, it was a good argument to make. Um, it was to the wrong venue. The CO the hearing official didn't like it, <laughs> but I thought it was a good argument. At the time, though, I remember back then, uh, 10 years ago, when we talked about this, I, I actually really admired your position on this, and I've represented many people who were more traditional conscience objectors, and for anyone, by the way, who's not familiar with this, in the active duty context, you have to prove that you're opposed to all wars for reasons of conscience, either religious or could be non-religious, if it has that same kind of um, emotional depth, I guess, if it's, if it has that, if it expresses itself in a way similar to religious people might express their beliefs, you have to be sincere and you have to have had that change of heart after you enlisted. It is possible, by the way, for people who aren't pacifists to meet that criteria. I've had clients who are, um, for instance, engaged in martial arts, and we could successfully argue we made the differentiation between martial arts in most cases did not involve killing people, war involves killing people. But nonetheless, what I appreciate the time and still appreciate was your consistency of saying, no, I, I'm not going to play this, I'm not going to play the game of trying to fit under a criteria I really don't fit under. I'm instead going to be very deliberate. Now, what I also, though, find fascinating in your case, and I've, in preparing for this interview, I looked back on some of my other cases and looked at case records and whatnot, uh, trial records, and I was struck by, in yours, you kind of had this perfect opportunity to resist in a way that kept the charges lower than they might have been. And could you share with us a little bit about what was the moment where you really crossed the line? Because this is this is kind of cool how it all worked out. Right, where, where I crossed the line. You mean in terms of just saying that I'm not going to deploy, or yes, as far as where where it was clear that you weren't going to deploy, the command had to take action. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Um, I think it would have been. Let's see, it wasn't May first. It was maybe the day before. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I got up really early. I, I didn't go to like the regular morning formation. And I just went to the, to the office, the, the, like the main office where like the commander and the first sergeant are. 
And I just said, I want to speak to the captain. And um, I mean, that's really not something you're, you're really supposed to go through like a, a process for the most part um, before you just speak to the captain. But um, so I remember waiting for a bit and kind of, uh, and kind of feeling from like the senior enlisted, like, what, what are you doing here? Like, what, like why, why are you, you know, like, you can't just do this like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but eventually I did uh, have my meeting with the captain. And, um, <clears throat> and I, I basically told them very, very directly that I just, my reasons and that I wasn't going to deploy. Mm -hmm. And then I remember something about medical records. You're supposed to take medical records to some location or what was the story on that? That was a little further down the line. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was the point, if I remember right, the actual charges you later faced were related to the medical records stuff. Um, when it was actually, in, in my understanding, what I re recall was it was one of the steps for your processing, pre-deployment processing. Is, did, do I remember that correctly? Right. So there was a series of counseling statements. The first one was on the next day, May 1st. Mm -hmm. where it was like, okay, um, you know, I, I told the commander what I told him the other day, but here on paper, you're going to say that you're, you're going to go ahead and deploy. Mm -hmm. and so I basically did not say that on that paper. And um, that was the first of many, many counseling statements. <laughs> the Army loves their counseling statements. They, they have their paper trail. Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it's all a justification for later action. That's yeah. what they, they paper things up. So they can, if, if someone else is looking over their shoulder, they can justify. Right. And so, um, yeah, at some point, yeah. You know, I just decided I wasn't going to deploy. And then later, you know, I was still involved in pre-deployment activities, like mm -hmm. uh, like preparing like our equipment to get sent overseas or, or things like this. And after a while, I was like, you know, I may not be going, but I'm still helping them. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to stop helping them. I'm going to, I'll, and that, that sort of escalated things to a different level because then I started refusing orders, like mm -hmm. day-to-day orders. And so like... Um, that led to a few counseling statements and it led to me sweeping the motor pool a lot because that to me was something I felt comfortable enough doing. <laughs> really helping them too much, like sweeping the same ground that has already been swept by. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, um, and so that happened quite a bit. And then S SRP, the, the main medical process well, medical and other things that you go through before you deploy to be, deemed fit to deploy. Um, uh, yeah, I just, I just refused. And that was a, another major turning point because that's really, that's really me saying there's, I'm really not going to go. You can't just, you can't just throw me into a plane without me going through this process. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what was, again, what really I think turned out well was we were not at a place of a showdown like literally you're getting on the plane and that's a um, couple months back we had a interview with jeff patterson and he told a story from the gulf war where he's literally on the tarmac and they're ripping his uniform off of him and telling him that they're going to murder him and his family if he doesn't get on the plane um hmm. in your case what worked out so well was was that the, you were able to and you had to do it multiple times for it to take it wasn't just one refusal to obey an order but in the end they, they couldn't ignore it, but neither could they really, they couldn't make some of their normal arguments. In fact, you know, one of the, the case that came right after yours um, was a case of Travis Bishop, and his is one I can share about because he was very public at the time. Uh, hoping, by the way, to have him on at a future time to interview him. His story was, was different, but it was at the same time period, the same post. But um, in his case, it was literally the night before deployment. He felt like he had to leave to get his headspace together to come back. And so it really, it pushed into a much more serious category. In your case, by having those smaller acts of resistance, it made the command have to do something, but they couldn't justify really some of the more extreme actions. I think they would have liked to have done to you, but they didn't have much. You didn't take your medical records to SRP. You declined to do actions that were supporting the deployment, but you're still willing to sweep the motor pool. I mean, it was absurd. They knew that. And uh, 
I mean, it would have been great if we could have gone to trial, but he insists on sweeping the motor pool instead of doing, you know, they, they knew that'd be a stupid charge. So again, they found, if I remember right, the only charge was related to the SRP the, delivering the medical records. And, and later on, by the way, in the press clippings, and I've, um, for those of you who are watching this on Facebook through the event, I posted in the comments some of those press clippings back in 2009. But the Army, their, their uh, public affairs officers, real quick to say, we didn't, we didn't prosecute Augusto for refusing to deploy. We, we prosecuted him for failing to deliver, to follow orders and deliver his medical records where he was supposed to. It was a really, it was, I will say this as a lawyer, I don't have this happen very often, but when you do, it's wonderful. You have a case where it allows the other side to save face, but give up a whole bunch in the process. So we, I wish all my cases worked out as well as yours, but it was just really fortunate how it all came together. So then what the, the procedure from there, once that happened, um, and it was a pretty quick timeline at that point until we had the, the summary court martial, right? It was pretty quick. Am I rec remembering right about that? Like the end, not, no, the time at the showdown at the SRP compared to that for when we actually had the summary court martial. Was that like a few weeks or a month or so? Yeah, at least, at least a month. Okay. Really going over the timeline, it's just I don't, I don't really remember a lot of these things yet. But good thing I have some Facebook documentation. But. <laughs> yeah. Well, what happened next was uh, Victor faced what's called a summary court martial. And for if you're not familiar with military courts martials, there's three basic kinds a general, a special, and a summary. General is the worst kind. You can give up to the statutory maximums, uh, life in prison, potentially the death penalty, all, felony conviction, all those come by way of a general court martial. By the one important distinction, many people are afraid of dishonorable discharges for other, for lesser offenses. You can only get a dishonorable discharge through the general court martial. Very few soldiers ever face a general court martial. So just as a, an aside here. The second kind is a special court martial. These are more common for AWOL desertion cases. You can face up to, and, I, and they've just changed the use, the uh, manual for courts martial, so the, the limits may have changed. But as of back in December, at least, they could give you up to a year in prison. They could give you a BCD, bad conduct discharge, take away rank, that kind of thing. But it ends up in federal misdemeanor range. And then finally, there's the summary court martial, which is a short, abbreviated procedure and it is weird as all get out. Good news is very low caps on sentences. In most cases, depending on your rank, the maximum punishment is around 30 to 45 days. It usually does not count as a criminal conviction for most purposes after the fact. Um, they, they're very limited in what they can do to you. The negative is by agreeing to go through the summary court martial process, you agree to a process where you, your, your attorney can be in the room but your attorney cannot speak on your behalf. The, and you end up, the whole thing is presided by a hearing officer who wears the hats theoretically of both judge, prosecutor, and theoretically, in most cases, defense attorney too. So it's a weird, weird process. It's, again, it doesn't look like court should look. So Victor, could you share a little bit of your impressions of what that day was like? I mean, I'm, you know, I was telling you about the law, but how, what was it like for you that, that day? Hmm. I think that I was mostly uh, relieved that he had finally arrived. Mm -hmm. It was all that uncertainty in the weeks that, that preceded it. And so by that point, I think I was, I mean, I, I just knew what was gonna happen. I think I was pretty, I pretty much accepted everything that was gonna, gonna happen. And uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't think of it as in a bad way, I guess, I, you know, I, I remember it as being one of the better days in the process. Mm -hmm. So what I recall was, was that in, in this hearing process, you were allowed to speak for yourself, to explain yourself to some degree. Do you remember kind of what was your main point or your main thrust of your argument that you made to the hearing officer? Well, I, I, not not exactly sure of what I don't know. I guess I was making legal arguments, and then you were you were 
you are giving me some things. Um, I, I remember us. I, I do remember one that we talked about some, and I think it came up some in the hearing was the idea that the war in Afghanistan was a violation of international law. And so the argument that you're making was, is that this, that, um, yes, I refuse to deliver these papers to the SRP. You know, you were, by accepting the summary commercial, you were, you were accepting that, yes, you did X, Y, and Z, but you were stating that you were legally justified in doing so because the war itself was illegal. And I remember, remember that argument. Um, the only thing I remember from that day, though, was, was that it was held in, not in the courthouse, but in a, in a small conference room, and it was pretty packed, mostly with activists. I remember Cindy being there. I remember, I think, at least one local reporter. And I think there was a New York Times reporter based out of Houston was there. Um, and just a lot of folks from under the hood. Um, and this, when I think also the time I think about this, was kind of, to me, a golden era at Under the Hood when there is so much energy and there was a lot of folks, um, not just the people there on the ground who were either stationed at Hood or had family members there, but it was also lots of folks coming in from Austin, from North Texas for events and whatnot. So I remember being a pretty full courtroom. Um, and then I remember afterwards, I, I can't remember what we did. I remember when you were being marched out and taken to the van and all. I can't remember if we put our arms, our fists in the air or what we did. <laughs> we did some, I remember it was, it was just one of those moments the military almost kind of created this, this little bubble to actually make a really clear statement on the record with the press there about what you believe, but also what your, your, the community of support was um, the position that, that there was there as well. You, you weren't in this alone. And that was, to me, was a really cool moment. Yeah, I remember you know, at the end of the proceeding, I ripped my rank off. And oh, yeah. I, <laughs> and then I wanted to take the rank off my cap. And then I was just trying to do this. And then you had like a knife or something. <laughs> and then we used that. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> That's hilarious. And finally, because they're the conference room, normally in a regular courtroom, you're not allowed to have a pocket knife in your pocket. But uh, I had it with me. So I remember I, uh, and uh, I think they were also kind of like, you don't have to do it right now. But it was, it was you know, the, you're, you were losing your rank. But I remember right, the, the, the rank, I guess it was, if I remember right, well, you, you weren't in the dress uniform. You were in like, I think, do they call them ACUs in those days? Or ACU, the regular, regular yeah. uniform. So you had the patch in the center with your rank, and then you had the patch in your, you had the, in your hat. So I think you, this was Velcroed on. So you, Velcro, so, and I remember uh, you kind of slammed it on the table almost. <laughs> in the feet of great strength or anything. It was, just <laughs> <laughs> it was a very memorable moment. Mm -hmm. So after that, of course, they, they drove you over, actually did all the processing. They took you to the county jail in Bell County, Texas, in Belton, which is about oh, 30, 40 minutes or so from Colleen. So what was, and you didn't have a long jail time. You were sentenced to 30 days, which I think right. meant you did 27 or so days of good behavior. I'm it assuming was, you, you had good behavior. Yeah, I think, I think it was 24 days. Yeah, yeah. They, they take out five a month for good behavior, I think. So that's mm -hmm. So what was your, what was the time in county like? I remember the first day being pretty rough, just because, just waiting, just being held in a holding cell, just being cold and stuff like that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but after that, it was actually pretty nice. Um, like, I mean, people knew why I was there. Mm -hmm. The staff knew why I was there. I think they probably got instructions to treat me well. Mm -hmm. Um... And so, yeah, while I was there, the first day while I was sleeping, there was, um, there was like a news report that came on the television. And so all of my fellow inmates in this like 60, 70 uh, man bay, like saw why I was there. <laughs> <laughs> the story was, was on the news. And so I woke up and, you know, they, they told me about it. And so I think that probably made for an easier time for me too. Just cause people were like, oh, you don't, you don't belong here. You know, you, you really shouldn't be in here. And it's like, okay. I'm glad you think so. I don't think any of us belong in here, but... Yeah. Now, were these civilian inmates, military inmates, a mix? Of, they were civilian, yes. They were pretty much all civilians. Mm -hmm. 
And that's one thing, actually, we got into a legal tussle on the case right after each Travis Bishops, because we look, we found out according to the regs, they were not supposed to have um, military inmates in general population, the civilian inmates. Um, in your case, I think it turned out just fine, because as I recall, they called, if I remember right, you told me they called you the professor, because you wore glasses, you're good at playing chess, and I think you must have answered people's questions. Or so. anyway, everyone thought you were really smart and you were well liked, is what I remember. Hmm. So after, so after your time in at that point now, um, you stayed in the clean area for a little bit after that. I can't remember how long you were there, but I remember there was a big celebration. Um, Anne Wright came down, and if any of you aren't familiar with Anne Wright, she is an incredible story. Uh, Retired U.S. military colonel for a while. I believe she was number number one or number two diplomatic official for the U.S. in Afghanistan. But she ends up leaving her position in protest, and from that point forward, is involved in all kinds of amazing activism, and still is to this day. But I remember she came down for the celebration, and uh, that was a really cool time. And then, how how much longer were you in the clean area after that? Uh, let's see. I got out October. Well, I got out of the military October 20, so I was still in about a month, mm -hmm. two months, two months after I got out of uh, out of jail, and then uh, I was probably in clean for another month and a half or so. Okay. Well, real quick, this is a good stop, natural stopping up for just one moment for a break. And I just want to mention, if anyone is watching, we have a fair number of people watching, but would love to hear some comments, questions. Uh, I do have one question or comment from Rebecca. She says, Victor, I would appreci appreciate hearing about what kind of influences throughout your life prior to your enlistment uh, that shaped your values. And oh, oh, I mean, She's typing this herself. Let me rewrite this. She says, Victor, appreciate hearing about what kind of influences you had in your life prior to enlistment that shaped your values and ethics and laid a foundation for you to be able to make this kind of stand for your beliefs. So, how would, so my, what, what would you say? Okay. Well, um, I don't know. I had a very interesting childhood. Mm -hmm. I can't really. Um, my mother was schizophrenic, but she went undiagnosed for uh, much, much of my childhood. Mm -hmm. This led to ha her having all kinds of problems with my dad. Uh, they eventually divorced. Uh, she en she en ended up being incarcerated when I was nine years old. Mm. Uh, for many years, I did not know where she was, what she was doing, if she was even alive. Uh, but yeah, during that time, she she lived a very difficult life, lived homelessness and all, all kinds of terrible things that, that she didn't deserve. But um, <clears throat> I don't know, I, I moved around a lot, went to lots of schools. I went to 13 public schools before I joined the military. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I know that this is a, you know, there's religious context to this, uh, to this podcast, I can't really say that I was ever a person of uh, strong faith, um, so I can't really point to that. Um, I don't know. I I think on some levels, um, part of what led me to reach the conclusions that I did is that I am able to mentally detach from a situation more than most other people. Mm -hmm. So I think I was able to see it more objectively because of the things that I've gone through in my life where I had to like suppress this sadness that my mom or, or this uncertainty of like whether my mom was alive or, or, or things like that. Um, just, just being able to just repress emotions in, in a way that's not healthy, that's still a, a problem that I have, but that it is, it is very useful in analyzing situations uh, in, in a more objective way. And so I think that that played a role. Um, I certainly didn't want to contribute to anyone's suffering, which mm -hmm. I, knew I was I was doing. Um, but beyond that, I can't really point to anything in particular. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I think also everyone responds to difficulties in hard and hard times in different ways. And I. Um, 
I'm always struck by people who have had really difficult family contacts or um, great tragedies like your mom's mental illness and it not being diagnosed and her not getting the help that she needed and how some people people respond to these tra traumas in different ways and um, I know I, th I think it's interesting how that that um, your the move towards objectivity was very helpful to you and yet also I could see how like any coping mechanism there's always a difficult part of it too but we have a lot more people have joined us in the last few minutes. Want to welcome Bob, Dennis. Very excited you're on, Dennis. She's been one of the most faithful supporters of our work here in Oklahoma with the Center for Conscience in Action. Scott, one of my old law school classmates, and often a very friendly. But uh, we've had we've had many political arguments over the years, but always appreciate him joining us. And of course, Karen, thank you so much for everyone who's joined us. Again, just a reminder, if you have questions, comments you'd like to share, please post them. I'll be glad to read them over here, over the air. And so far, what we've talked about, just kind of give a recap to those who've joined us late. We're telling, we're talking to Victor Augusto about his experiences 10 years ago. He was a U.S. Army active duty soldier deployed to Iraq. During his time in Iraq, he had a change of beliefs about the morality of participation with the U.S. military. He then later was, was stop lost, was supposed to deploy to Afghanistan, instead disobeyed some of the orders leading up to his deployment. So he ended up getting sentenced to 30 days in jail, ended up uh, leaving the Army with a mid-level discharge. And so we're now at the kind of the part of the story of talking through, he's out on the other side. You've, you've made it out of jail. You're in the clean area for a little bit longer, but then after that, uh, you head back. And assuming you, you went back to Florida, right? Yes, I went back to Miami. So I wanted to next to talk, share, talk with you a little bit about just how did those experiences 10 years ago, how did they shape what was to come? You know, you've, you've lived 10 years of life since then. Um, so what's, and I, I uh, again, I share as little or as much as you want, I, but, you know, what, how did those events shape where you were going, have your views evolved, changed? Um, what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty open person, so I don't really have anything I need to, I feel I need to avoid mentioning. But um, I mean, it completely changed the trajectory of my life. Like, even before refusing deployment, I think just having become an activist and then refusing deployment, going to jail for that, it, it certainly, it certainly was the main factor that basically basically determined the trajectory for the, at least the next nine years of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I I got back and I just wanted to to you know to make a change to, just in whatever way I could. So I I um I became hyper activistic. I think uh, I I went back to school, but in school I was more concerned with organizing than I was in. Uh, you know, getting a degree. Mm -hmm. So that didn't last too long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I totally relate. Uh, that's uh, been there and I did graduate, but. <laughs> well, that was the second time I dropped out of school because of <laughs> not, not focusing on, on my schoolwork. But, um, but yes, I, I always remained involved in activism. Uh, first at student organizing, then I was in the uh, now defunct ISO for a few years. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, yeah, from the well, from the time I left, I, I was in the army. I was already in the army, so and so I did that for a while. I did some Palestine solidarity activism and just just general, just sort of activism. Just sort of like if there's an emergency, if there's an emergency demonstration that needs to happen, if Troy Davis is about to get executed. I, I mean, I was. I was very much immersed in all of that stuff. How did you make make ends meet while you're doing your activism? Uh, I had some money from uh, from my time in the army that I had saved. Um, I also, uh, I mean, I had I had a decent job after a while. What were you doing in tech world? Um, no, no. I, let's see, my first. My, well, my second real job back from the army, I worked for a friend that uh, he, he owned like an online store. And so I just uh, worked uh, preparing, you know, his, his merchandise for shipment and putting information in QuickBooks and, and things like that. So that, 
that paid well enough to, you know, just for me to support myself and do activism. Um, but eventually that uh, business, well, I had to be laid off after my, my friend died and then, uh, Mm. Yeah, it was, uh, and uh, the lady who took over just she couldn't afford to pay me anymore <clears throat> and so uh, yes then I was uh, unemployed for a while mm -hmm. uh, and that, that was rough very rough period um, and yeah part of it was just yeah I was very demoralized at the time because I also had this discharge that wasn't so great mm -hmm. uh, this non-college degree um and so basically all I had was, uh, you know, this activism and this activist community, mm -hmm. I was somewhat estranged from my family. Um, and uh, yeah, and it was, uh, yeah, some rough, some rough times. Uh, mm -hmm. I eventually uh, met, um, met my late girlfriend. Mm -hmm. She helped me get a job. The worst job I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I worked at a call center making very close to minimum wage for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the job was good for me in that like I had never had like a really low paying job like that before. Mm -hmm. That sort of uh, <laughs> inspired me to work, work for something uh, a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so eventually I got into coding. And I, now I work as a, as a developer. Mm, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. But uh, yeah. yeah, but in the interim, like uh, my girlfriend died like a year ago. Mm. So very difficult. And she had been sick for a year before that. Yeah. But she was an activist and I met her through activism in the Green Party. I was very much involved in that for a few years. Eventually became the co-chair of the Green Party of Florida. I was in charge of like the Jill Stein campaign mm -hmm. in Florida as uh, the volunteer coordinator. But um, yeah, but for the last year or so, I really haven't been involved in, in any activism. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I, I, I do find a lot of echoes in my own life, some of your experiences and in bits and pieces, but uh, I also sp spent quite a bit of time with the Green Party and uh, still have a lot of good friends from those circles that have stayed with me and people I really treasure and value. Um, these days I'm probably on the fence about electoral politics generally and I don't talk about it a lot here because again we are a you know religious humanist community so you know 51c3 and all that good stuff but I will say that I've uh, met some of the best people I've ever known through Green Party circles some really good folks so. So um, in and I know that, and, and this is also what's so challenging in talking through um, our histories as it relates to activism, is that there's the personal, there's the political, there's the overlap, um, and also sometimes, too, the need for self-care. Um, that, again, that part of your story of having to um, take a back seat at times in, in activism um, has definitely, for me, it was when I got married and, and uh, then became a parent, a step parent. It really changed my priorities pretty dramatically, but it's, it's, I don't know, still an ongoing how we work through all those things. I, one thing I was thinking about tonight for our conversation, and by the way, just a reminder, we have just a little bit of time left for anyone who has joined us. If you have questions, comments, please feel free to ask them. We'd love to involve you in the conversation. And also for those of you who may be watching later, this will be available in recorded format. Um, we'll have some, if you have feedback, you can shoot it to me at email james at objector.church and I'd be glad to pass it on to Victor himself. But uh, we'll have some ongoing conversation um, as well. One of the things I'm thinking about now as it relates to your story, and I'm thinking about not just your story, but that whole generation of resistors. And there's, I'd say between 2008 to 2012, there were quite a few. Um, some went the country objector route, some went a more politically motivated resistance, some found, easy, found ways to be discharged out of the army early and quietly, others uh, went to prison, some went to Canada, 
some got deported and then went to prison, some stayed there. This whole generation for a wall, and then the numbers of resistance really dropped off for a bit. And what I saw from, and this is anecdotal, I can't prove this, but my experience has been that it's almost been directly tied to the economy. And that when the economy really took a downturn, uh, for a lot of people who joined, leaving was not an option. Even if they felt very morally conflicted, they, for many folks, what I heard who came to me, and, and those who did, and less came to me, frankly, as an attorney, but those who did, the, the challenge was leaving, they, they joined the military out of financial desperation, and leaving the military meant going back to where they were. And it really, I guess that's, that's the challenge I see now is that in, in approaching from an organizing standpoint of how to, I'm convinced the way to end war is to address it on the service member side, to, you can't fight wars the service members won't, won't fight them. The problem though is that because our country has kept people so poor for so long, more and more young people really feel they have no other choice. And people who, in previous generations have a multitude of choices feel less and less empowered. And so I guess one of the questions I would have or thoughts, and this is more of a conversation point than a real question, but given this reality, I mean, given this much wider gap, just in 10 years, the gap between, uh, particularly for young adults between rich and poor has really spread out. I'm really torn about how to approach this from an organizing standpoint, because it feels like urging people to leave however way they do that without a backup plan seems irresponsible. And yet we can't just be silent in the face of what the U.S. military is doing. So I don't know, do you have any thoughts or along those lines? Yeah, a, a couple of things. Um, I think just the further we get into the war on terror era, I think it also, it also just brings a different, a different person into the military. Like, mm -hmm. I could still have been naive in 2005 about what we were doing. And that's not to say that a person can't be naive now. I mean, but, but it's a lot harder, I think. I think we've internalized that, that this is just what this country does. It, it goes to war. It, it, it's, it's always going to be that way. No one can change it. And that's just, it's, it's a job like any other. And I feel like people who, who go, go into it kind of have that attitude. And people who are in it kind of have that attitude now that we're, Whereas before you could be more idealistic about your joining. Yeah. Um, so, and, and right now, like the military is, is having a lot of trouble recruiting. Uh, 2018 was like the first time that the army didn't meet its recruiting goals since 2005. Mm -hmm. the, the Marine Corps is having a lot of trouble recruiting. And so, um, yeah, I think that the, the people who, who said that we should focus on counter recruitment were probably right. Mm -hmm. That should have been the, the main focus because that's it it i think it it isn't seen as as, as cool as it was when i joined i think uh, i think the millennial generation doesn't doesn't think of the military the way that maybe i was brought up to to view it and that's a good thing. and that's a good thing so i'm I, I don't know i have more more questions than answers for for any of these things but uh. yeah yeah, I do too. And I also, one of the things, I guess one of the great disappointments I've had in activism was the most, for the most part, the collapse of the coffee houses. Because I really saw them as such an essential, what I saw during the Vietnam era, what changed things, what wasn't just resistance, individual acts of resistance, it was collective. And it was to have collective resistance, you needed a place for that to happen, you needed space, you needed room where people can be themselves and I, that little golden era and again i'm thinking about late the latter part of the previous decade early part of of this decade there was that space i can remember times where you know i'd be down in colleen to uh to to visit and support in various ways and you know a lot of times i'd be crashing at the coffee house there'd be two or three other uh other people there, again, most of these, a lot of things are active duty folks who just needed to be off the base, who needed to be in a space where no one was going to yell at them that they could be themselves. And even though five in the morning they were having to hoof it back to the post to make formation, they needed that space. And it, to me, it's so tragic those spaces aren't there. And yet, I also know from the other side of it, um, 
uh, Victor and I think both were at different points were on the under the hood board and it's hard to sustain a place like that to make it happen. And the other coffee houses had the same experiences. It is very, very difficult, particularly in a military community. It's hard to get people from the activist meccas to come to these communities and those that do, it burns through them really quick. And yet, boy, it's just hard for me to see how we can move forward in the kind of organizing needs to happen without these kind of spaces. And I don't know what I'm not so much a question, but just a generalized comment that it's it's really a tragedy that things have I keep hoping something will change, but I don't know what it's gonna be. Well the one thing about that is that I think that during the Vietnam era, the coffee houses were were started by soldiers. Mm -hmm. Right? Not civilian supporters that mm. those things. And so I think that 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 was a limitation of uh, you know, our, our movement with the coffee houses is that it was sort of initiated and supported by civilians. It didn't really, I mean, soldiers were part of it, but they didn't really, it didn't really come from them. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I mean, I think it was still a good thing because it probably wouldn't have existed at all. I don't think that it would have arisen organically uh, from the soldiers, but it is a, a significant difference, I think. Mm -hmm. I also wonder if there's also just from the general broader culture you did during the 1960s and the early parts of the 70s, you did have all of these liberation movements. You had women's liberation, you had gay liberation, you had black power, you had all of this message of empowerment coming in from so many different places that I, I wonder if is it's kind of like that, that kind of energy is infectious and even in the military, they, they can't stamp it down. Well, today, I don't, I wouldn't gener I wouldn't I wouldn't characterize any part of our culture today as being empowered or liberated. It seems like that there's a it's a different kind of repression, but it seems like in some ways more pernicious. Right. Well, we're just about out of time. I'm going to throw out if anyone else has any comments or questions. We've had a lot of folks join us for part of the podcast tonight and hoping we can have more conversation after this. One of the folks, I was hoping we'd have more folks from Under the Hood back and they could join us live tonight. So if you couldn't join us live, I would love to hear your thoughts, comments. Again, shoot me an email after this, james at objector.chart, or you can post it on our Facebook. We'll have there where you can join the conversation after this. We will have, we usually have an edited version of this, just a little slicker and, uh, and whatnot. We'll have that up on our website in a few days. Um, also, I do want to mention just as a quick little aside or kind of a closing thing that with the Objector Church, and for those of you, we haven't talked with the Objector Church much tonight, but we are a religious humanist community. Um, we are approaching these issues of ethics, morality, um, the big questions, identity, meaning, but we're seeking to do it from a humanistic, human first standpoint. And we're seeking to do it respecting the various religious traditions and the ideas they have about the divine and whatnot, but not tying ourselves to any one of them. Saying as a community, we can find commonality that transcends these cultural expressions. Um, but we also serve an important function organizationally. We are the fiscal sponsor for Courage to Resist. And Courage to Resist has supported my work as an attorney for a long time. And in Victor's case and Travis, as I talked about tonight as well, and many other cases, when um, these, these folks didn't have to put up their own money. Courage to Resist was able to fundraise and so that I could still eat and do my work and not have to worry about the money side of it. And so it's a really important work. The challenge we have with Courage to Resist is, is that as the energy seems to be in the popular culture is dying down right now, our funds are, are very low. We need funds very badly to keep doing this work. So there's two options I wanna share. One is of course, Courage to Resist itself, courage to resist.org. There's information how to donate there. There's now, we're now doing memberships as well, Courage to Resist, where that you can be an active part of what we're doing in various ways. But also from the objector church side of things, what we're doing by one is that we are providing the 501c3 status to Courage to Resist, which is critical. But it's also one thing we're doing with the objector church is specifically creating a space where people can explore the big questions and have some and do it in community. 
And we're also doing something specifically on issues of conscience, such as the objector registry, where that young people can register what they believe now long before war is ever called. And uh, we are also stand ready to support resistors of all kinds. Certainly conscience objectors, that's a part of what we are, are personally about as an organization. We also support other kinds of resistors, those who resist for political reasons, for other reasons, um, we stand in their corner and also whistleblowers. So I encourage you, if you have the means to do so, even a little bit helps. Um, from my end, I'd like to keep doing these webcasts every week, but if we don't get some more funds, I'm gonna have to do, do these less because I just won't be being paid for it. So um, this is selfish on my part, but I encourage you, please consider giving. So I'm gonna check one more time, see if we got any more comments, questions or anything. And again, I thank everyone so much for tuning in tonight and, um, Victor, is there anything that you'd like to share with our audience, um, you know, from your experience or just what would you like to share? Maybe some closing thoughts. No, I mean, maybe there's some things I would have liked to have gone back to, spoken a little bit more about, but I, I don't really have any. <laughs> well, we got a few minutes left, like three or four minutes. So if you got any, anything you'd like to go back to and talk about or. Well, just um, like before the, uh, before the court martial, and just um, uh, for example, how how Dar Jamil got involved, and he wrote. Um, oh yeah, he wrote that that article where where it, it referred to the Sea Lift program that I that I wasn't involved in because I wasn't in the Navy. Um, let me let me put that into context for people. I can't really wasn't really prepared to talk about that. But there were several articles written while I was uh, refusing uh, deployment and refusing orders. And probably the most impactful one was one written by Dar Jamil, where he basically spoke about the things that I had been doing and about how I had refused uh, SRP. And he mistakenly put uh, that, that SRP was some kind of sea lift program and so this this uh, this part of the article was eventually used by the army, at, basically to like say what the charges against me were, like the the, the sea lift refusing a sea lift or something like that. <laughs> it's not really possible for someone in, in the army. But, but yeah, so they were definitely reading uh, his articles, and um, I think that was one of the key factors in getting me a summary court martial as opposed to. Uh, the one that's above that. Mm -hmm. Well, and Dara's writing was just so, um, in Travis's case, he wrote so eloquently about Travis's experiences, but also such of the trial, kind of putting it all in context. And um, what's interesting to me on, on Dar Jamel, and I haven't talked to him in years, but the last time I heard from him, he now has shifted a lot of his attention in writing to the global climate crisis and really the existential risk that climate change has is for humankind. And that really has stood out to me because uh, tying up environmental justice with war is, I, I, to me, was a, a huge, uh, I think a lot of us have forgotten that. I think I have. And uh, I really appreciated Dar. Dar's pivot on this, really focusing his energy in that direction has been helpful to me. At the same time, I haven't had the courage he has to face that issue head on the way he has, because it really gets to the question of will humans still be here 500 years from now? Um, That's a question. I think it, it's the most, most important thing for us to focus on, actually. Mm -hmm. It's like the acidification of the oceans. I mean, and, and on all, every report is worse and worse when he talks about the, the rate at which the, the ice caps are melting. It's Oh, I, was, I saw it in my own eyes a couple of years ago. I had a trial at, uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. And so in my after trial, I took a little short boat ride out to see the glaciers. And at one point, they stopped the boat in the middle of the channel. We had two or three more miles to get to the glaciers. And they said, so many years ago, this was where we would stop to watch the glaciers. And I think it was with under 10 years, and now we drove a few more miles down, and now here's where the glaciers are. 
it was a stun. They said, give another 10 years, this glacier won't be here anymore. I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I mean, just see, seeing it with your own eyes, it's horrifying. Well, on that cheery note, I think we're at the end of our time together. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and uh, hope to have you again sometime. And uh, also just want to, again, mention if anyone out there has, uh, wants you to, uh, I would love especially to have future interviews with other folks who are involved with Under the Hood or were involved in um, organizing of all stripes uh, with the coffee houses, uh, with Coffee Strong, with other things like that. So um, I would love to hear from you if you're interested in being interviewed. Uh, my email again is james at objector.church. And finally, if you like what you're hearing, please follow us on social media and consider joining our community. You can find out more at www.objector.church. And we'll make one last check, make sure we don't have any more comments or anything, and we do not. So I guess we'll call it, call it a night. Thank you so much, and we'll hopefully see you again soon.